thank you, Angela. Thanks for organizing the exhibition. Also, thank you very much to the Miller Gallery and um, the awesome Kara, the awesome Margaret. And thank you to the studio um, for hosting this talk. And thanks to you for showing up. Can you hear me? Can, like, I, am I speaking into the mic? It's good? It can be louder. OK, great. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'll start my presentation. So I'm primarily going to talk about my project, A Piece of the Pie Chart. It's a feminist robotics project. And I'll talk about, you know, my approach to robotics in this project and also uh, my approach to collecting and visualizing data and my difficulties in collecting and visualizing data. So, um, so this is the project it's um, a food robot. It puts uh, pie charts onto pies, and those are pies you can eat. And the pie charts um, depict gender ratios in art and tech spaces. So what you do is um, you use the computer that you see over there, um, where I'm standing in the picture. Um, you use the computer to select a gender ratio and so a, a pie chart, and then you put an actual pie into the machine, and the machine has a conveyor belt, so first it moves the pie under a heat gun, and the heat gun warms up the chocolate covering of the pie, and so that it's kind of sticky, and then it moves um, the pie under a robot arm, and the robot arm puts a goes finds the corresponding pie chart and sort of like sticks it into the warm chocolate so that it sticks there. The pie chart is made out of um, paper and it's not edible. I've experimented with edible paper, but it doesn't conserve very long. So anyway, then it takes uh, then the conveyor belt moves it under the webcam that you see over there. And it takes a picture for Twitter. This, this thing has its own um, Twitter, Twitter account. It takes a picture for Twitter, and then it prints out a label so that you can, if you want to, you can send it to the place where the data originated, so like where the gender ratio came from. And I'll talk a little bit more about like what data is in there, how I collect it, etc. So um, for, or you can also, like I also encourage people to, or in previous versions of this project, I've encouraged people to take the pies w to their workplace to discuss uh, gender equity with their work colleagues, sort of do like a consciousness raising thing. Um, but it's not possible in this version of the, um, of the, in this exhibition, this is not possible. The CMU risk management does not want any pies to leave the gallery. So <laughs> I'll be preventing you from taking them. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the project. Uh, I'll show you a quick video of how it works. Uh, I have to turn on the video. So I'll move forward a little bit because it's kind of boring at the beginning. Okay, so this is the section where I select the pie chart, and then you, you know, move the pie chart in the machine, uh, I mean the pie into the machine, and the pie looks more like, a, is more like a cookie. This warms up the chocolate. Then, you know, the, the conveyor belt moves it forward, goes find the, the pie chart. Takes a long time. This is a vacuum cleaner.
So you can retweet the image if you want to. Um, yeah. So the, the label comes out of the label printer. And then you can package. I, I forgot to film that part. So you can package the pie, et cetera, put the label onto the box, but not in this exhibition. Uh, yeah, OK. These are some pictures from an exhibition. So I did a previous version of the project. And I did a previous version of the project where I used like extremely cheap robots. So I want you to just look at this. It's really scary. Um, so it's pretty much the same, except it's with super cheap toy robots. And if you're into robots, you probably know these. Um, they're so this is like the, the first version of the project. As you can see, the robot makes painful sounds. <laughs> or here. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so um, the project is obviously inspired by um, my own identity as a woman in art and tech. Um, at some point, like you probably had a similar experience at some point, you, I started asking myself, you know, the question that most women in tech eventually ask themselves, or most minority in like a majority field ask themselves why, you know, are most tech roles occupied by men? Um, why are there not more women artists shown in galleries and museums? So that those are like the questions I've asked myself at some point. And in the beginning, uh, early on, I came across a, a book that was written at Carnegie Mellon in the late 90s. Um, it's called Unlocking the Clubhouse, Women in Computing. Um, the authors did a study using undergraduates in the computer science uh, department. And um, they found that by you know, changing the culture of how computer science was taught both in high school and university, by changing that, they were able to attract more women um, to computer science and also to keep them in computer science, like to keep them interested in computer science. So uh, what, what, was that, what I loved about this book is that it, uh, it, it described the gender gap as a cultural issue rather than as something that's like innate in you know in in women and men or uh, some sort of like gender problem um, so this book you know by framing this this uh, the the gender gap as like a cultural problem that can be overcome it introduced me to feminist science and technology studies in a way um, so i would define feminist science and technology studies in that you know, that, that, that the gender gap is really due to some, some problem in the culture and it, it is and can be changed. So this is a quote from Donna Haraway. Probably no talk is without a quote from Donna Haraway. <laughs> so, but I, love, I really love this talk. Uh, I, I mean, not this talk, this quote. Um, so it's kind of difficult to explain. I, I love it sort of on an intellectual level, but I, like, I'm really bad at explaining it. But it also goes into this, this idea that uh, a lot of things are cul cultural constructs and not necessarily uh, innate in, in us. So um, this is from her book, 
uh, simian cyborgs and women, the reinvention of nature. And um, so she's a theorist, she's known as a theorist, but she also has a PhD in biology. And in the book, she talks about primate studies, um, where, and, and this quote talks about like where researchers have translated primate behavior into human behavior instead of looking at how, you know, human culture shapes human behavior and human nature. So um, how we are is not somehow innate, but rather a product of the culture we live in or like. So, but at, at the same time, um, people, like when it comes to the gender gap um, in technology, uh, uh, like even in this century, people are still trying to explain it as like, uh, you know, a problem of like statistical differences between men and women. And so uh, this, is, it, this is a paper from 2008, um, and it asks the question, why are there so few women in inf information technology assessing the role of personality in career choices? And it basically comes to the conclusion that men and women differ systematically in their interests and that these differences can account for an economically and statistically large fraction of, of the occupational gender gap. So. They, they say that there are statistical differences between men and women, but are not necessarily looking into how the culture shapes those statistical differences. So, um, feminist science and technology researchers generally don't frame the problem as innate, rather they're looking at gender and, te in, uh, gender and tech culture in a more sort of holistic way. And what interests me a lot is like the to look at when, or sort of looking at creator roles, because I feel that's where it connects to, um, where it connects to art, or sort of like art, also art history. So, um, in, in, even in the 80s, it was known that women have, like women in tech jobs had primarily operator and executor roles, while creator jobs were largely reserved for men. This is from um, Machinery of Dominance by Cynthia Cockburn. And in 2008, there was a study by the Harvard Business Reviews called the Athena Factor, and they, they studied women in science and tech and uh, math and STEM jobs, essentially. And they found that women didn't get ac equal access to creator roles. Um, and that many found the, the path to promotion really difficult to navigate. And it's also, uh, there have also, there've been millions of studies. Um, one that I find interesting is, uh, is, is one that looks at like venture capital and how venture capital is distributed. So it looks at gender and venture capital decision making, uh, the, ex the effects of technical background and social capital on entrepreneurship and um, basically found that women who didn't have sort of a formal engineering degree had far more difficulty getting venture capitalist backing than men without a formal engineering degree. So th this is sort of like this, this create the idea of the creator role. That's where, in my view, it, it connects to art. So this is an article from 1971 uh, by Lisa Nochlin, um, feminist art histo history. Um, she looked at at creator roles within visual art history. And she found, and this is a really interesting article, I recently came across it. And I can't go, it's, it's pretty long and I can't go into the details, but basically she found that among other things, um, women had a disadvantage in, in art early on because they were not allowed to do the same things as male artists in visual art. So it found, for example, that women were not allowed to sketch nude men. Instead, they had to sketch cows. <laughs> so <laughs> here, here is the, the sketching class with a cow. Whereas like men could sketch nude women. It was not a problem. So there was th were these like weird moral things. Um, she also has this great quote. Uh, this is sort of like a talk that's mainly made out of quotes. So, um, but uh, in the Lisa Nochlin article, there's, there's this um, great quote about privilege. Those who have privilege inevitably hold on to them and hold tight, no matter how marginal the advantage involved, until compelled to bow to superior power of one sort or another. So this is, is from 1971. 
and yeah, so so this is from <laughs> this is not a quote. This is from Science and Technology Studies from Judy Wakeman's Feminism Confronts Technology. So she found similar things about the tech world. So official plans to rectify the underrepresentation of women in engineering often proceed as though the problem were simply a lack of self-confidence in women, but male dominance of technology in large part has in large part been secured by the active exclusion of women from areas of technological work. Yes, anyway, so, so with my project, I do want to advocate for women in the workplace, but I want to frame the workplace as more than work outside the home. So there's a reason why the installation or this like sort of ro robotic assembly that I've made here uh, consists of household electronics like a vacuum cleaner or like a heat gun and, and you know, products of ho household labor like the pies. So there's a reason for that. Um, generally, household work and caretaking is not necessarily seen uh, as valuable, you probably all know. Um, so in also, likewise, innovations made by women concerning the household especially concerning the household, are not seen as important because oftentimes those innovations are incremental. So like perfecting a recipe is an innovation, but it's, it's oftentimes incremental and takes, takes a, uh, is developed over a long time. Um, and we're generally, I would say this is generally true, that we're historically biased towards innovations that are large in scale and backed by a lot of capital, like, I don't know, the iPhone, or you probably can think of of, an, of innovations that, that are celebrated, like this robot over here. Um, so <laughs> so th th there's this kind of large scale backed by lots of capital uh, that, that we, these we celebrate as a society, these kinds of innovations, whereas like the household innovations are less, less celebrated. Um, most of the robotics work that advocates for getting sort of like women, girls, and minorities involved in tech is focused on education. And I personally, I think that's great, but I personally prefer uh, like technologies that overtly protest. So, or prefer to make those. So here's another quote. Um, so the, these like confidence building apparatuses, like, um, wait, these? Uh, they're typically, um, wait, must find my quote. Um, they're, they're typically sort of like focused on education with, with like turning a blind eye towards, you know, what comes afterwards. So um, in Machinery of Dominance, Cynthia Cockburn says, it's not legitimate to simply urge women forward without considering what waits for them on the other side of the door of equal opportunity. So I'm more interested in like what lies on the other side of the door of equal opportunity. Um, oh, thanks. So I'm also more interested in protest. Um, so I made a protest robot. And it, these are fairly common. Uh, so this is um, an early protest. I would call this an early protest robot. It's called Tipu's Tiger. It's um, in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. It belonged to Tipu, the Sultan of Mysore in India. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, by the way. So um, this is Mysore. Anyway, so um, the, this belonged to Tipu, the Sultan of Mysore. It was, he was known as the Tiger of Mysore, so he had this automaton mate. Um, and it, it depicts a tiger that is eating a British soldier and it makes like you, there's a crank. I don't know if you can see it. There's a crank you can, uh, or people can uh, turn it and it makes sound and the, the hand of the soldier goes like this, like, ah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like a, a statement of defiance against, you know, the British colonizers that eventually vanquished him and found this automaton at his palace. So you may know these other protest robots like Natalie Chermenchenko, Feral Robotic Dogs, and, um, and the Institute of Applied Autonomy. So 
Um, yeah, so I, I'm also, so this was kind of like the, the section of the talk where I talked to my, about my approach to robotics and I'll also talk a little bit about my approach to collecting data. So um, uh, collecting and visualizing data. So the, the part about visualizing the data is pretty short. Uh, I visualize data on edible pies and, you know, <laughs> to make it clear that this data has some sort of economic implication like the fact that women are not equally participating. Or in some cases, women are more than, are, are possibly equally participating. We'll, we'll look at that later. But okay, so how I present the data in the exhibition is like, uh, one side is primarily dedicated to art and technology spaces, the other is more dedicated to technology companies in between our um, things that are in between like tech conferences. So my approach to collecting data. So there are two types of data that I'm showing. It's um, uh, data that's collected by companies. Uh, so you may know that like Facebook and uh, Pandora and Google, Apple, LinkedIn, whatever their names are, Twitter. Uh, they're doing they're doing this kind of s census among their workforce, so they look at at gender, they look at race, and I think that's it. So they look at gender and they look at race. They do a kind of a census. So I take that data, and 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 I display it. But I also collect the data myself. So for example, here we have um, this a graph, uh, art gallery in 2016, two women, 15 men. And so I say presented gender because I, I look at uh, artist bios, I look at how people present, and based on that, if they use female pronouns, I, I say woman, if they, they use male pronouns, I count them as men. And it's, it's very, uh, people have, criti those, uh, a critique of this project has been that I'm perpetuating, you know, the gender, the, the uh, sort of like the gender binary um, by by presenting uh, the data like this, and it, it's the, my response to this is that people overwhelmingly present themselves in that binary, like in their in their um, artist bios and so forth. I would also love to do a census of the art world, much like you know Apple and Facebook and whatever are doing, like a census of of the of their workforce, but this it, it really is it it would take a lot of time, and I'm not sure if it would also not be somewhat creepy if somebody would be hey you've had an exhibition tell me all about like you know gender race possibly sexual orientation I'm not sure if that would be slightly creepy, so yeah so I I would be interested in doing a census but it's of self-reported data but so far I'm just I'm looking pretty much at like how people present present themselves. So yeah, so in in this uh, in this exhibition here I have categories, um, tech conferences, art and tech venues, art and tech grants, fellowships, art and tech awards and prizes, and creativity and tech in Pittsburgh. So that's kind of interesting. Um, if you have some recommendations of what other creativity and tech I should look at in Pittsburgh. So um, I looked at, um, I, I just did sort of an overall search and Angela helped me a little bit as well. So what's interesting is that um, the gender ratios really vary. So for example, the co-create creative uh, business ignition program has, is overwhelmingly women Whereas like the Pittsburgh Technology Expo and Conference, their, speaker, their guest speakers are overwhelmingly men. And um, yeah, the Pittsburgh Tech 50 Startup of the Year finalists, the founders of those finalists are primarily men. Whereas like the, the CEO of the year turned out to be a guy, but the finalists were, had at least two women. So um, yeah. Um, I also try to find, uh, I try to often find like things of the same, or places of the same category. So for example, 
Um, I, when I compare residencies, like gender ratios in residencies, I try to find two of the same type. So for example, uh, the Autodesk residency, so company-sponsored residencies, like the Autodesk uh, Artisan Residence, and the Adobe Creative Residency, it's often surprising. Uh, the findings are often interesting. So like Adobe has a lot more women than um, Autodesk. Um, iBeam has made, uh, it's an art and technology center in New York that you probably know, has made a lot of effort to um, have more women among their residents. Um, I also look at, when I look at galleries, I look at, you know, solo exhibitions versus represented artists. So the solo, like while in one year they may have more solo exhibitions by women, they may still represent uh, a larger fraction of artists, or at least uh, represent that. So that's my approach to collecting data. Here are some other approaches to collecting data. This is from the year, um, the year uh, 1971. Um, it's the, re the Los Angeles Council of Women Artists report. It's part of an archive at the Getty, but they were also, even in 1971, they were counting um, women and men in shows. And I mean, if you look at the number, it's pr numbers, it's pretty depressing. So they were looking at primarily the Los Angeles County Museum of Art because it's a, a, tax, a partly taxpayer funded um, place. And they issued a report um, to protest uh, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And they were really, um, what they did as well was they, um, they, they called a meeting with the director they um, sent this to their state representatives so that it would be let uh, it would be read on the on the on the floor of the uh, on the floor of the California legislature. So they really demanded changes, and um, and I find that is still it's very it's very inspiring certainly. Um, so here's. Um, uh, as, as part of my one year per period at LACMA, I did a workshop with other, other um, um, artists. And this is, art, uh, this is an artist, this is one of the original protesters, and she's singing a protest song while I'm holding a mask. Uh, this is also from early protests. So these are masks uh, that depict um, a curator that was particularly known for preferring to only show men. And then here we have the Gorilla Girls. You probably know them. They, um, they, they did posters and uh, also collected data on museums since 85, 1985. Uh, this is the Gallery Tally Project um, directed by Michal Hebron. They have th what they're doing is they collect data, they make posters, uh, they collect data about um, galleries, and they make posters, and um, uh, exhibit those in um, in nonprofit spaces. So, um, what's interesting is like that these are like really huge group shows where people are showing their posters, and so like they're participating in exhibiting exhibiting posters while also protesting the gallery system. Um, it has, so Gallery Tally currently has a Facebook group which has like around 2,000 uh, members and it's very active. They have exhibitions in many, have had exhibitions in many cities. This is one of my favorite posters. Um, you can see the reason why. I like pizza. Um, I like pie shaped things. So this is protesting Catherine Edelman Gallery. Uh, this is another one that I really like. And these are the countesses, so women in the art world. I think this is in Australia. Uh, this is Gender Avenger, uh, a project I also really like and participate in. And uh, the Ars Electronica, Kiss My Ars, um, protest, uh, protest, protest hashtag by Heather Dewey Hackborg. Uh, there's also a, a bakery or like a, 
an ad agency in Romania did this did this campaign with Paul. It's called Bittersweet Pies. I think it it uh, it also uh, shows uh, gender ratios on these like pies, um, and they um, were wondering whether this was an original idea or not. I don't really care. I like I like this. Um, so the pies like actual cakes because they're really well made and uh, other stuff that I'm working on. So this is kind of like the end of this talk. Um, so other stuff I'm working on. So I'm currently working on an audiovisual performance about motherhood and the workplace. I'm using a breast pump as an instrument and it's a part, it's like there's a video part. Uh, this shows stills from the video and on the left, uh, up, uh, upper left corner shows the, the costume that I plan to wear. It's an LED pumping bra. And it just, it generally explores topics having to do with motherhood and technology. So like freezing your eggs, um, for example. Um, another sort of like future work thing is that what I wanna do is like sort of an overtly feminist period tracker app. I haven't yet done it, um, but I find that period trackers are sort of like very focused on, on like your period and what it means to you, but I, want to make uh, a period tracker app that like what it means to others. So if somebody's already made it, please tell me. Um, yep, like for example, you know, the, fee the financial cost of a period, like, you know, all these tampons and things you always have to buy. Anyway, so this is it. Um, if you have ideas for projects I should look at, please tell me. And thank you for listening to my talk.